So good morning and uh, welcome to MDM East. Uh, welcome to the four revolutionary effects of automating catheter manufacturing. My name is Paul Ogden. I'm a mechanical engineer and director of sales at ASG Medical Systems in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, I've been involved in manufacturing automation for 30 years, uh, first at Motorola, then at Siemens, uh, then at Tyco International, and now for 10 years at my own company, ASG Medical Systems. By the way, I've never worked for Ford, uh, but I really like the new Mustang. Uh, is anybody else a Mustang fan? Camaro fans? Uh, Challenger fans? Too bad for you guys. This, this is all about the Mustang. So, uh, I decided to slip the, the Boss 302 into this presentation because I think it looks great, you know, much better than a catheter, and it sounds a lot better when you open it up, too. Okay, so manufacturing automation. Let's start with a simple definition. The use of computer-controlled machines to perform basic factory processes and to feed products and data into and between processes. So let's get a little bit deeper into it. To extend the definition a bit, we're going to talk about layers of automation. The more layers you have, the more automated your factory. And that leads to all the revolutionary effects that, that I'll be talking about shortly. Now this slide shows seven layers, starting with the most basic level, uh, automated processing. The top layer is automated product transport, and we're going to look at each one of these briefly. So the lowest layer is the process itself. An example that I like, that I like to, to use is tube cutting. Now, the tube cutting is a fundamental process in catheter manufacturing. Catheters are made of, of tubes. It can be done by a person, a razor blade, and a ruler. It doesn't require automation to do it. But an automated tube cutter can do a better job and do it at least five times faster, sometimes 20 or 50 times faster, depending on, on how difficult the job, the job is. So we could say that the automated tube cutting process has at least five times the goodness of the manual process. We're going to use the term goodness for now uh, as kind of a shorthand for the four revolutionary effects. Now these next slides roughly illustrate the added goodness of each new layer of automation. So once a basic process is automated, the next step is to automate the feeding of the material into the process. Automated parts feeding gives us another, say, I would say doubling of goodness in our manufacturing process. Okay. Now most factories have to do changeovers. They're not just running one product. So we need to think about automating the changeover process. This requires two elements. The first is data download, also known as recipe storage. Uh, this simple but important function gives us the ability to change processes quickly and without having to enter the numbers into the machine. So data entry errors are eliminated and the setup is the same every time. Now for a complex process, this feature adds a lot of goodness. And I'll talk more about that later. The second element of changeover automation is setup automation. So what do I mean by that? Setup automation means that the machine needs no mechanical adjustments to be performed by the operator to complete a setup. So these adjustments are done automatically by the machine. Where tooling needs to be changed, this should be a robust and simple drop-in replacement. And if possible, the tool should be trackable by software using a barcode so the machine confirms that the correct tool has been installed. Now, this is a definite goodness thing, okay? So once the process itself is automated, uh, there's still big benefits to be gained around the process. Every critical process in the factory requires measurement of sample product to stay within control. If the measurement can be automated, it becomes faster and more precise, more goodness. Measurement automation includes the automation of the test preparation, uh, the measurement and the data analysis. So ideally you'd like to be able to take a sample off your machine, put it in another machine that can prepare that sample, measure the sample, and give you the data back in a readable form that an operator can use. So you don't have to have, to have a highly te trained technician doing this measurement for you. Now in some factories, machines have to be shut down while product measurements are taken so, th so that the engineer can be confident that they're not going out of spec while he's off doing the measurement. And uh, so the automation of the measurement multiplies goodness by reducing the time when the machine is shut down. And in fact, the ideal thing would be to integrate that measurement into the process so that the machine doesn't have to be shut down. So finally, in advanced factories, product collection and product transport are also automated. Now picture a semiconductor factory. I know a lot of us who are in the medical industry spent some time in the semiconductor industry way back when, when you didn't we could do that on our shores. You know, you have a dinner plate sized wafer 
uh, that's handled only by robots in and out of cassettes in standardized sealed boxes. Each cassette holds the equivalent of thousands of chips, and I heard a figure someplace uh, $250,000 you know, worth of product in one cassette. So there's a lot of efficiency there. The boxes are transported by miniature automated electric vehicles on rail systems throughout the factory, and they're very rarely touched by a person. In a car factories, components are stored in pallets, and these pallets are transported on AGVs or conveyors. This high level of automation is an economic requirement, really, in a modern car factory or a semiconductor fab. Now, computers guide products to the correct process at the correct time, and inventory is never lost or mixed up. Um, we're not going to get above that layer, but you can imagine how wonderful that is when, you, when, you know, when your computer system that runs the factory knows where everything is all the time and, it, and is constantly optimizing the flow of product throughout the factory. Now, I'm not aware of any catheter factory employing automated product collection or automated product transport, but it needs to happen someday, and it will. Finally, fully automated factory control is, is almost a freebie when you have this level of automation. So here's the result of a fully automated factory where the goodness is many times higher than where we started with a razor blade and a ruler. So where is your factory today? Do you want to get higher on this scale? I think you know, most, most uh, catheter factories are very low on the scale. They might, be, they, might be, uh, they might have an automated process. They might have some automated processes. There's very little automated handling or setup or data download, and there's, there's, no, there's nothing above that. Let's talk about a hypothetical situation. Get back to the basics here. So let's say you want to produce a new Mustang Boss 302 coupe. So burden labor is typically uh, $30 an hour in, in the U.S. That's a, a good rough number. This number could be $70 in Bavaria, so if you were building BMWs, or maybe $6 in Costa Rica. Uh, for the U.S., $30 is about right. <coughs> If you're running a two-shift operation, that's $125,000 a year to staff that one operation with one operator per shift. So we'll say that current capacity is 10 cars per shift. So have you ever had this conversation? Your boss says, by this time next year, I want you to double output and cut costs by half while increasing quality and yield. Now, yesterday, you might have said, I quit, or you know, choice or words to that effect. Um, today, you can say, I was hoping you'd ask. No problem. This is how you'll do it. And here's a spoiler alert. Uh, it's much simpler than you might think. Now pay attention because, whoops, okay, the next slide uh, has a lot on it. So yesterday you would have bought, you just would have bought a second machine for $100,000 uh, plus floor space if you have enough and utilities to support that machine. And you would have needed an operator to, to run the machine on each shift. So your total cost will be $225,000. So it's $100,000 for the machine and $125,000 for the labor to operate it on two shifts. Now today, you add an automated feeder to your existing machine. This doubles the capacity of the machine for about $50,000. In other words, I'm saying that the feeder is roughly half the cost of the machine. That's, that's a good rule of thumb. Now you don't need any additional operators because the automatic feeder takes the place of the operator at the existing machine. So this operator is now about 80% available. They spend maybe one-fifth of their time loading that process and, and watching over the process. And they have 80% of their time available to do other tasks, like, for example, SPC measurement. So you save about 80% of the labor on this process for a savings of $50,000 uh, per year. Okay, now that was, we were really focusing on cost there. I want to refocus on the capacity piece of that because that's just as important. What the feeder did was double the capacity of the existing machine. And that's typical. Uh, we see that over and over again. A, a manually fed machine just doesn't run all the time. The operator just can't, can't stay that focused all day long. So when you feed it automatically, we get twice the capacity out of it without really doing anything to the machine. So yesterday, you had to add capital equipment, add operators, and by nature, add variables to the process, whereas today, when you add automation to existing equipment, the operator becomes an inspector, so they're actually adding value to the process instead of just acting like a robot. And this reduces variables because the automated machine is just inherently more precise and more consistent than, than an operator. 
which leads us to the next slide, improving quality. So at my company, we often see that an automatically loaded machine improves the process quality. In fact, we always see that. Uh, we make a point in making sure that we see that. <laughs> Many automated uh, feed systems actually position the part in the machine uh, for processing, and they do this typically 10 times better than a person can do. So the process spec, the process specs out 10 times better, and this means that your process is in control. And that is the third revolutionary effect of automation: cost, quality, excuse me, cost, capacity, and quality. Now every level of automation positively impacts quality. For example, automated data download eliminates data entry errors on setup. I have to tell you a little story about that. It's a little embarrassing. This just happened this week. We, we do some tube cutting uh, to support our customers who aren't yet ready to buy an automated machine. So we have a little tube cutting lab and we do a little bit of production in there, not very much. And sometimes we get some very difficult jobs. And we recently ran a large difficult job that we've run several times before. And we, I'm ashamed to admit, don't always use automated recipe download when we run that tube cutting lab. Um, and that bit us this week because we had an operator who adjusted the process, you know, a skilled operator, an experienced operator who thought he was doing the right thing. And he adjusted the process and uh, you know, the, the SPC that we were doing on that process didn't, wasn't in depth enough to catch the error. And so we got a call from the customer, and now we're going to cut those 70,000 parts again. And uh, if we had used our own, you know, medicine here with automated recipe download, it's very unlikely that the operator, he wouldn't have had the authority to go in and change that process. The machine wouldn't have allowed him to do it. So if he had a, a, pro a problem with that, he would have had to call the engineer, and then hopefully the engineer would have said, hey, wait a minute, I've been here before. I know that this doesn't work. So it gives you an extra layer of protection. So let's talk about yield, because that's obviously something we <laughs> just took a big hit on in our factory. Um, when the process is in control, you have a much lower oops factory, right? You get more good oranges out. Um, all these layers of automation actually eliminate opportunities for error. That's, what, that's one of the things that's crucial to understand. And each time you do this, you reduce the yield loss, because it's, it's defined by a recipe download by a computer and not by a person you know, squinting in a ruler. Um, so automation makes the yield go up. That's the fourth benefit of automation. Now this saves you money and actually increases capacity because you aren't throwing away product. And sometimes that product can be quite expensive um, and equally significant, you may not have the capacity to make it again. Now once you prove this to your quality engineer, you can actually reduce inspections and save even more. So to recap, uh, yesterday you had to spend more money on labor and machinery to get more capacity. That capacity varied depending on the skill and attitude of the people doing the processing. The quality varied from shift to shift and from day to day. The yield was never 100% and it varied. The causes of the yield loss changed from day to day, so they're hard to control. I don't know if I've done process engineering in, in you know, big factories with not enough automation and you know the Pareto of problems changes from week to week, so it's very, very difficult to get your handle on get your hand on what is the problem and go kill that problem because it's always changing when there's operators in the loop. When the machines are running, they do have problems, but the problems seem to be very consistent and they can be solved with Pareto analysis. So now we have uh, some videos to show you that just kind of illustrate uh, real short videos. In fact, it's so short you have to watch carefully illustrate the an, a non-automated process. This is an operator feeding, cutting, and printing a feeding tube. Okay, so she's printing it with a Sharpie marker, and that sounds crazy, but that's the state of the art of the industry. And, and it took about, uh, we sped it up because it was much slower than that, but it took about 15 seconds to do that, and you ended up with a part that was cut to about plus or minus an eighth of an inch, and it had three marks on it. So if you want to know where something in between those two marks is, you're out of luck. Now this is a, these are feeding tubes, so the, the doctor's gonna put this you know, down into your stomach to feed you, and he wants to know how far he's putting it, so it ends up in the right place. It's kind of important. All right, let's look at the next one. So now we've automated that process, and there's, I think, four levels of automation that I counted on this. Uh, on, yeah, we don't make it, get to make Mustangs. Somebody else does that. Okay, so here's the, here's the video of the automated process. So this is the basic tube cutting process. 
I'm not allowed to step away from the mic. The blade, there's the feeder. Now you see the part being pulled out. So there's the automated uh, uh, feed out. There's the automated marking. And you can see it's marking a lot more than three places. There's the barcode data entry that starts the process. And the tooling is changes in seconds and has no adjustments. So you can't really get it wrong. You can barcode that tooling as well. So there it is again, automated feeding, automated processing, automated download, um, automated outfeed, automated cutting and printing. So we really covered four of the, I think, seven bases that I gave you. We, we don't yet have automated SPC. We don't have automated material uh, handling between processes or, or material collection. We have built machines that do that, but, but that's very rare in this industry still. And that's it. Happy to take questions now. Uh, well, the machine you just saw wasn't even in production yet. That was in our factory, you know, getting ready to get shipped. But, but similar machines have been in the field for, I think the longest one of this type is seven years, producing about one catheter every 10 seconds, you know, two shifts. I'm going to restate the question. So what wears the most? Um, yeah, good question. You know, drive wheels, I mean, the rubber parts on the machine, um, uh, that's really about 90% of the wear. And we try to make those parts very, very easy to change and remove um, so that they can get back in production quickly. Um, you know, there's a lot of electric motors on the machines. Occasionally, one of those motors will fail. They're not that expensive. Um, so. So you asked about how precise is the cutting. Well, that depends on the material. Um, if the material is, is a hard plastic, we just did a study uh, a couple of weeks ago where we actually took one of our standard cutters and, and modified it to give it a more precise, higher resolution encoder. And we actually had a standard deviation of 1.3 ten thousandths of an inch, so about a sixth of a thousandth of an inch. Um, that's as tight as we've ever needed to go. More typical in this process, um, you might have a standard deviation on cutting a rubber tube that's four feet long. Uh, standard deviation might be a millimeter. Um, it can be less, depending on whether you're willing to slow the process down. Um, but it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's a normal distribution, which is one of the keys, right? When there's an operator in the loop, you don't know what's going to happen next. I'm out of time. All right. Thanks.